Uh, this, this chapter is a little bit like going into a restaurant that has like a huge menu. You ever done that? You go into a restaurant and you know, they hand you the book of the menu. It's like a hundred different items and you want one of everything. Um, so hard to make your decision. That, that's kind of me going through this psalm. Th this psalm is absolutely amazing. Of the 176 verses, at least 171 of them mention the Word of God. The whole theme of this psalm, Psalm 119, is the Word of God. Um, I thought this was interesting. I found this in David Guzik's commentary today. He writes, being such a long psalm and the longest chapter in the Bible, this psalm has been of some historical note. There have been many lengthy works written on this psalm. One of them is by Thomas Manton, a Puritan preacher and writer who wrote a three-volume work on Psalm 119. Each volume is between 500 to 600 pages in length with a total of 1,677 pages. That's how much one commentator was able to mine out of Psalm 119. There's an interesting story as well about a guy named George Weishart. He was the Bishop of Edinburgh in the 17th century. He was condemned to death, and he was actually on the executioner's scaffold, and as the custom of the day was, he was allowed to have one psalm sung before his death. He chose Psalm 119. Before two-thirds of the psalm was done, his pardon arrived, and he was not put to death. Just a funny story. Okay, so we don't know who wrote Psalm 119. Some people believe David wrote Psalm 119. Other people suggest that some post-exilic scribe, maybe Ezra, compiled Psalm 119. It's interesting in its construction because it's an acrostic. You'll notice that, in most Bibles at least, at the, that the beginning of every eight-verse section, you'll notice a heading. So the first one, for instance, is Aleph, and then at the beginning of verse 9, you have Beth, then at the beginning of verse 17, you have Gimel. There are 22 sections that have those subheadings, and that's because the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. Each section of Psalm 119 is given a heading that corresponds to a Hebrew letter of the alphabet, and then every verse in that section starts with that letter. So if it corresponded to our alphabet, the first section would be A. Every verse, verse 1 through 8, would start with the letter A. Then the second section would be B. Every section in that, or every verse in that section would start with the letter B, and so on and so forth. So just kind of an interesting construction. You see a similar thing over in the book of Lamentations. Um, one of the things I'll say is this, again, with so many mentions of the Word of God, and there's several different words that are used for the Word of God in this psalm, there's actually eight specific words that are used for the Word of God. Two Hebrew words for word, uh, one appears 24 times, another appears 19 times, then you have judgments, which appears, I think, 19 times, testimonies is used 23 times. The law of the Lord is used 25 times, and so on down each of these words that describes the Word of God. It's been suggested over the years, you know, my ministry history has really been uh, involved in Calvary Chapel. And over the years, people have criticized Calvary Chapel. They've said, oh, you know, in Calvary Chapel, because Calvary Chapels historically have been very committed to teaching the Bible, teaching verse by verse through the Bible, um, you know, many years ago, that, that was kind of something that really set Calvary Chapel aside. The reality is that many churches nowadays will teach verse by verse through the Bible. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, but many people would often say that in Calvary Chapel, we were worshipers of the Word instead of worshipers of Jesus. Which to me makes no sense, because Jesus Christ is the Word of God made flesh. So if you read this and give yourself to it, it's because you know this is Jesus in a sense. He is the Word of God made flesh. Also, Derek Kidner, a commentator, writes this, The untiring emphasis on the Word in Psalm 119 has led some to accuse the psalmist of worshiping the Word rather than the Lord. But it has well been remarked that every reference to Scripture here, without exception, relates it explicitly to the author. Indeed, every verse from 4 to the end of the psalm 
is a prayer for affirmation addressed to him. This is true piety, a love of God, not desiccated by study, but refreshed, informed, and nourished by it. It's also interesting that over in Psalm 138, the Lord there says that he has magnified his word above his name. Now, look, for you and I in a day and age when most of, maybe not most of, but certainly a lot of the entertainment that we see coming down the pike is peppered with examples of people taking the Lord's name in vain. Okay, God's magnified his word above his name. But remember when that was written, to utter the name of the Lord was a stonable offense. Remember when Jesus was teaching to the, or talking to the Pharisees and he said, before Abraham was, I am, they picked up stones to throw at him and kill him. So for God to turn around and say, I've magnified my word above my name, which they equated with, if you spoke it, you could be put to death. That means God thinks very highly of his word. That's important because you know as well as I do in many church circles today, this is treated very frivolously. There's not a lot of reverence that's used when we approach this. And what we do a lot of times is we approach the Bibles as critics. And in becoming those who critique the Bible, we fail to let the Bible critique us. You know, we determine, oh, I, I don't know if I agree with that. Doesn't matter. Doesn't make it any less true. And the day will come. Jesus himself said, heaven and earth will not pass away. Not one jot, not one tittle of the law will pass away. The smallest brushstroke of the Hebrew pen, that will not pass. Heaven and earth is more unreliable than the word of God. So we turn our attention tonight to the word of God, Psalm 119. Now, again, I'm, I'm skipping over a lot. Okay, This is going to be like standing on the banks of a lake and taking a rock and just skimming it across the surface. There's absolutely no way, time would not allow for us to just look at every single verse tonight. But it begins by saying, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Now, I'm just going to draw out a couple of things as we go through this. So jump down with me, if you would, to verse 6. This is where we started tonight, sort of in our call to worship, where he says, when I look into all your commandments, I will praise you with uprightness of heart. There's another reference to this. You don't have to turn there, uh, but over towards the end of it, he talks about how seven times a day I praise you because of your judgments. Sometimes I think the way that we've structured our church service is very counterintuitive. And, and I know that it would be very difficult to change it up because we've just kind of gotten, as the church, very programmed to the idea of, you know, I come to church and there's 25, 30 minutes of worship, and then we have the Bible study. But in some ways, I feel like we should come in, maybe have one or two songs, study the Word of God, and then have about 20 minutes of worship. Because worship's a response to the Word of God. You know, when we see the Word of God and everything that this has in it, everything that God reveals about Himself in this to man, that He's taken the time to write down how he sees us and remind us of all the great things he's done. I mean, it's like when you study the word of God, it's like, yes, that's awesome. And it's kind of a travesty that by the end of the service, we're like checking our watches and like, I got to go get my kids and, you know, got to get to lunch and all that kind of stuff. Instead of, oh, now that I've looked into your word, let me praise you. Of course, we may not do that here corporately, but that's certainly an approach you can take to your personal Bible study, which I hope we all have, that you just sit and spend time looking into the Word of God. And as you look into the Word of God, as the result of that, you give time to praise Him, to utter thanks to Him, to tell Him how good He is. And it's, it's kind of this cyclical thing because... You know, we get into the word of God and then we spend time worshiping him. And as we spend time worshiping him, he warms up our heart a little bit more. And as the result of that, you just kind of want to read the word a little bit more. And then you read the word a little bit more and then you, oh, Lord, you know, and I, oh, you're so good. And then it becomes kind of this self-reinforcing thing. Of course, when you're not spending any time in worship or you're not spending time in the word of God, 
neither of those things are really enforcing, reinforcing each other. And it becomes even harder to get either one of them started. It's so important that in our personal devotional time, we're doing this. When I look into your commandments, I will praise you. Not when the pastor gets up to open the Bible and do a Bible study. Then I, when I look into your commandments, I will praise you. That's what the psalmist says. Okay, uh, come over to verse 9, kind of in the second section. Great verse, personal verse to me. Verse 9, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? This, and, you know, you hear people talk about their life verses. This is really kind of one of my life verses, if not my life verse. I mean, th this was me. How can a young man cleanse his way? Many of you don't know, my background was one of lots of drugs, lots of alcohol, just a very hedonistic lifestyle, singing in bands and touring and kind of getting into that whole lifestyle. And you know what? It was not until God got a hold of my life that my ways were cleansed. That's what cleansed my ways. And, and there's a lot of, and it's not, it's not to downplay the programs that exist, but but so many programs that do exist are sort of step-oriented instead of regeneration-oriented. Instead of God just radically getting a hold of your life. You, you want to know what the Bible study was on the day that I went home and flushed my bag of pot down the toilet? It was on marriage. Had absolutely nothing to do with pot. Had absolutely nothing to do with drugs whatsoever. I was going to church, and they were in. The, I'm, I'm like 22 years old. They're in the middle of this marriage series, the couples of the Bible. Now look, here's what happens. Sometimes we come to church as consumers, and the tendency is to come into that and go, oh, I'm not married. How is this going to apply to me? It's all the Word of God. It's all truth. And I cannot explain it to you. It was not a step program, and I cannot put it up there on an overhead and diagram for you how the Holy Spirit used a series on marriage to speak into my heart and get a hold of me and say, Psst, go home and flush your weed down the toilet. All I know is that's what happened. How can a young man, and it's, it's interesting that God like talks about like the most rebellious class of person. In my opinion, young men are a lot worse than young women. And younger men typically have a tendency to be older than older men. It's not that older men can't sin or young women, but, but young men, very rebellious. But ha if a young man, if God can work in him to cleanse his ways, he can work in any of us. How can a young man cleanse his way? Listen, it's not by listening to the word of God. It's not by being a Bible study junkie. Oh, I listen to this Bible. It's by taking heed according to your word. It's by doing what this says and living it. Don't make the mistake of thinking that listening to a study equates with doing it. I think sometimes we think that. I think sometimes we think as long as I sat and heard it and nodded in the right place, that that somehow equates with, I've gone out and done it. No, it doesn't. In fact, James talks about that. He says, don't be a forgetful hearer. He says, go out and do it. Because the person who just hears the word of God, they're like somebody who checks their reflection in a mirror, and then they go away, and immediately they forgot what they looked like. I've seen those people. They're usually in front of me during traffic. Check in. Of course, I don't have that problem, right? But I mean, they're just checking and then two minutes later, it's the same thing a hair. And then five minutes, it's like, dude, put the window up. You know, I don't understand. The window's down and I'm checking my hair. Five, checking, do, 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 do. <laughs> and I forget what I look like. Instead of the person who goes out and does the word of God, he says in verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I immediately think of Jesus in the wilderness. When Jesus was in the wilderness, and of course Satan came and tempted him, you know, hey, if you're hungry, command that these stones be turned into bread. And Jesus' first three words, it is written, right? Read it on the page, hid it in his heart, spoke it with his mouth. 
Three important things when it comes to the Word of God. Find it on a page. Hide it in your heart. But learn how to speak it with your mouth, too. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul is listing for us the great spiritual armor, armor, you know, the, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sandals of the preparation of peace, the helmet of salvation. He talks about the word of God, right? The sword of the spirit. But the word that's used there for word is the Greek word rhema, which means the spoken word. So in spiritual warfare, if we're going to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we have to speak it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Three times. And of course, the Scripture tells us in the book of James, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus in the wilderness. Three times. Satan, hey, if you're hungry, turn this in. You know, uh, it is written. You know, and hey, if you're the son of God, go up and throw yourself off the temple because God's not going to let you dash. It is written. And then he says, you know, bow down before me and I'll give you all the nations of the earth. It is written. Satan left. We're not told to flee from the enemy. We're told the enemy will flee from us. A lot of times as Christians, we're trying to figure out how, how can I flee from the enemy? We're not supposed to flee from the enemy. We're supposed to stand against the wiles of the enemy suited up in the spiritual armor and using the word of God, speaking it in a warfare fashion. It is written. It is written. It is written. But first, you got to find it on the page. Then you got to hide it in your heart so that you can speak it with your mouth. Your word I have hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Powerful, powerful truths. I love verse 18. He says, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law great prayer to pray right before you study the word of god right right as you're there sort of in the quiet sanctuary of your heart in our time of worship lord open my eyes that's not just a catchy phrase in a worship song like we just sang open the eyes of my heart it's lord open my eyes so that i can see wondrous things you ever you ever have those moments when you're reading the Word of God and it's just the Holy Spirit just like takes it and just kind of, and it's like the light bulb goes on. And you're like, oh, oh, oh. I'll never forget when I was laying on my couch in Lilburn, Georgia, reading my Bible, Romans chapter 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, and I remember sitting up on my couch and out loud to an empty room saying, what? Because we spend so much time trying to do and work and prove. But that's not grace. That means we're owed something. But to him who does not work. And I was like, Gung. And it was one of those wow moments when you're reading the word of God. Those are, those are powerful moments to have. And the thing about it is, when you have them, here, here's what will happen. You'll start telling other people about them. And what will happen is you'll, you'll quickly determine if the people you're telling have had one of those experiences before. You know, because it's like, oh, yeah, me too. And, and it, as opposed to, you know, you're, you're telling somebody that and they're looking at you like, and there's, there's crickets, you know. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But, dude, when the church begins to discover or rediscover, whatever it may be, the riches of the Word of God and every single individual believer is just, we're all having these things with the Word of God where we're like, woo -hoo. And it may be different for you than it is for me. What I see, what God shows me, that's because it's living and powerful and you're in a different place. But it's, this is supernatural. This, this right here and, and what we're doing, this is supernatural. In fact, it's so supernatural that Jesus tells us Satan would love to snatch away what we're talking about tonight before it even sinks into the soil of your heart. Because Satan knows how powerful it is. That's why he doesn't want people to hear it. 
or why he would love to twist it, as he often does. Uh, Jump down with me, if you would, to verse 25. Uh, He says, my soul, what what a vivid description. My soul clings to the dust. You ever had like one of those days where you're just the inside of your mouth, it feels like you're your, your, your tongue has a sock on it. That's, how, that's what I think of when I read this. It's like my soul has a sock on it. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. It's another verse very similar to it over there in verse 28. My soul melts from heaviness. Oh, man. This is poetry. The literal translation is, my soul drops from grief. Strengthen me. How? According to your word. Nine times in this psalm, you see the phrase, revive me according to your word. Revive me according to your word. There are lots of definitions floating around in the world today, in the church today, about what revival is. True revival will always accord with the Word of God. Do you remember in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23, young King Josiah, he sends somebody up to the temple, Hilkiah, Hilkiah, and he finds a book, it's the book of the law, and he comes back, and he doesn't even say he found the book of the law. He says, I found a book. You know, if you look at the number of times that the word of God was actually read in a public setting in the Old Testament account. Between the time that it was read in Joshua's day to the next time at least it's written about 500 years. And then between that occasion till the time that Hilkiah found it, 250 years. But Josiah finds this book and he reads from it and he he. He's so impacted that he tears his garment. And he says, we've got to repent. And they go through this whole campaign of tearing down the idols. There were actually sexual prostitution taking place in the temple. There were idols. They were sacrificing children to Molech. They do away with all of it. Why? Because of this. Because of the word of God. And listen, because one man read it and was impacted. Don't underestimate the power of one life that reads this for what it is and gets set on fire for God to impact an entire community, an entire nation. That's what we see God doing through Josiah. I love this quote. Works that claim to be revival can be measured according to his word. So anytime that you see on the internet, revival's happening over here, here's what you do. You quickly look at it and you ask, is it biblical? Does it accord with scripture? And if it doesn't, it's not revival. It's not real revival. And look, that should not surprise us. We hear that and we think, oh, Kevin, how can you say that? You know that in the end times, one of the things that's going to keep tons of people out of heaven is a false religious movement. Even the false prophet's going to be able to call down fire from heaven. Signs and wonders is not the guarantee that revival is genuine. Satan has the ability to mimic signs and wonders. The way we know if it's real and true is that it accords with Scripture. Is it biblical? That's what we need to ask. Okay, uh, jump down to verse 37. Again, you can kind of see how I'm skimming through all this. What I encourage you to do, go back and read over this on your own. Because again, I don't feel like I'm doing it tremendous justice tonight, the way we're just kind of shifting gears and going from here to there. It's like we have the fast forward button on and we're skipping chapters on a DVD. Verse 37, turn away from my, sorry, not turn away from my eyes, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. And revive me in your way. Notice he doesn't say bad things. He says, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. Uh, The word worthless there is belial. 
And, and you know, here's the thing. It, it demands scrutiny because I think sometimes, I mean, I, I'm speaking for myself here, okay? True confessions of a pastor time. I spend so much of my life asking the question, well, is this bad for me? Instead of asking, is this good for me? And there's a lot of stuff in this life. It's not bad, but it's not good. In fact, it just has no worth whatsoever. It's just worthless. He says, turn away my eyes from worthless things. You know, Paul the Apostle says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. And I, I do believe that we should pray and strive to be people who ask the question, not is this bad, but is this good? Does this help me? I'm allowed to do it, but is it going to help me in my walk with Christ? People ask all the time, are we allowed to do that? Are Christians allowed to drink? Are Christians allowed to dance? You're allowed to do whatever you want. You will not find a broader ethic in any religion than this. All things are lawful for me. You can do whatever you want. You can go and stand on your neighbor's lawn tonight and bark at the moon. The question is, why would you? How would it help you? So instead of asking, am I allowed to? We should ask, should I? Is it good for me? Is it going to help me grow? Because believe it or not, the Christian life, and I know we don't like to talk about this, the Christian life is actually goal-oriented. We would love a version of Christianity that has no expectation. Don't mistake grace as, being, as God having no expectation. Okay? Because when you really get grace, Titus chapter 2 thunders at us that, you know, the grace of God has appeared teaching us, us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live godly and righteously in this present age. When you really get grace, it's going to change you. But Paul the Apostle talks about that this is a race. We're running in a race. We just taught our kids this. Over the summer, it was our VBS theme. But how are we to run? We're to run in such a way that we're going to win. So there's a goal in mind. Paul said, forgetting the things which are behind, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, okay, I'm going to skip over some other verses. Uh, come with me, if you would, over to verse 67. I'm jumping ahead a lot here. And I'm just going to briefly mention something here, but you'll see it if you read through this on your own. Verse 67, check this out. He says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Look at verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. He says in verse 75, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right, and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Seven times the theme of affliction comes up in Psalm 119. But he says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. And in fact, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, so that I have learned to keep your statutes. Don't make the mistake of thinking... We, we sometimes think good thing from God, bad thing from devil. <laughs> That's a very simple theological breakdown of how many of us think. Good thing from God, bad thing from devil, you know? But, but check it out. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Good thing from God? No, from devil. I'm going to nail you to a cross. Bad thing. From devil? No, from God. I'm convinced that when we get to heaven, I'm going to go, oh. So all that stuff that I thought was good and blessings weren't really, oh, 
the bad thing that I prayed you would take away? That was, oh, now I get it. The New Testament says, to you it has been given, and the word there means it's a free gift. To you it has been, it's a free gift to suffer on behalf of Christ. Oh, praise God. That's awesome. I want all the kingdoms of the world, but, but look, so often the things that like are shiny and go, oh, oh, oh. you know, look, Avin, our little one, he, Kaysen was so good. He was so good. Like when he, he'd find something like this on the ground and he'd be like, mm, 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 mm. And he'd come and he'd bring it to us. You know what Avin does? And you're like, Avin, what's in your mouth? Mm? That's me. That's me as a Christian. So many times I find this shiny thing over here and I'm like, ooh. I should probably pray about that. Kevin? Hmm? Okay, sorry. You know, that, that's just me. It's good for me that I have been afflicted. How, how radically would it change our prayer life if we started saying, thank you, God, for the affliction. It's so good for me that you afflicted me. In your faithfulness, you afflicted me so that I would learn to keep your word. Wow, that's powerful. Go over to verse 97. I'm kind of jumping in thirds here. We jumped from 37 to 67. Now we're at verse 97. He says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, check this out, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my, under, are my meditation. Verse 100, I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Interesting, verse 98, he's wiser than his enemies. Verse 99, he has more understanding than his teachers. Verse 100, he has understanding more than all the ancients. Wisdom. Wisdom from the word of God. All scripture 2 Timothy chapter 3, we studied it together, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This will give you more understanding. And, and this is not in any way, and it shouldn't be taken in the direction of, okay, so I shouldn't go apply myself to education, right? It's all I need is for my kids to get a hold of this passage and say, see, I have more understanding than all my teachers. No, 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 no. That's not what this is saying. He's saying all these group, groups have wisdom, but through the study and application of the word of God, I, I love it when God gives supernatural wisdom in a situation that through sitting in a room and just thinking about it, you couldn't figure out. It's so cool when God does that. When God just, through the word. And again, I, I'm going to go back to, you know, uh, the, the opening story I shared tonight about me and where I was at in my walk and how going and listening to a series on marriage, how God met me. There's nothing wrong, and don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. There's nothing wrong with like having something in your mind that you're hoping God will speak to you about um, and going to the Word with it, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But I would say this. Don't let looking for that very specific answer drive you crazy to the point that you're just not reading it and allowing the Spirit of God to just speak through a passage that you had no idea he was going to use. Again, that to me is what makes the thing supernatural. Is when you're reading something and you're thinking, oh, okay, I've heard this passage a million times and I would have no idea how this applies to me. This is the children of Israel and, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just, and you're like, whoa. And that thing you were hoping to find is there. But it's like the Holy Spirit just illuminated it to you. 
Tremendous wisdom. I, I love verse 105. It kind of ties in with this. I mean, if he just if he just exalted the wisdom from the word of God, look at the direction. Verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And we many of us have heard that old song, right? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Which probably if you've never been in the woods before, lost in the dark, with, you know, with a flashlight, this probably doesn't have a whole lot of value to you. But if you ever have been in the woods in the middle of the night, lost, and you have a flashlight, it's like, this thing. I, I remember going on a camping trip one time. Uh, I, I sleep really bad. And... Um, <laughs> to this day, and we're starting to notice that Kaysen is like this too. We, Amanda went into the, the room the other night and Kaysen had gotten out of bed and he was, he was standing in a corner and he was just trying to walk forward into the corner. And I'll never forget, I woke up in the middle of the night, I was camping with some friends of mine. There was like eight of us in this tent. And I got up in the middle of the night and I could not see a thing. And I just started walking across the tent and I'm stepping on everyone, you know, and, and nobody knew it was me, you know. <laughs> People are like, who is that? Who's stepping on me? And, and I, about halfway through it, I finally woke up, you know. And uh, I've had weird things like that happen to me when I'm camping. I have. I'll never forget one time. This has nothing to do with the Bible study. I was camping one time. It was a huge church camping trip, and I was in a tent by myself, 50 yards away up the hill from these guys who were having this campfire. It was probably 3 o'clock in the morning. And I had obviously, in the middle of the sleep, my sleep, rolled over onto my arm. And I was sleeping like this. And my arm had fallen asleep. And I had a dream that a raccoon got into my tent and was attacking my arm. And I woke up sort of awake. I wasn't really awake, but I was in that half wake, half sleep. And, I w and I'm taking my arm that's asleep, thinking it's being attacked by a raccoon. And I'm just going, ah! and I'm just slamming it against the ground, you know? And so I finally woke up and I realized what was happening. So I stumbled out of the tent and down to the guys having the campfire. And I'm not kidding. All three of them were like, they were just staring at me. They were like, did you hear somebody screaming up there? I was like, yeah, I think that's what woke me up. <laughs> I've never forgotten that to this day. Again, that has nothing to do with this. But I will say, being in the dark without light is a freakish thing. Anybody here ever camped in a, in a cave before? Like in one of these caves where they take you down and like it, you're, it's black. And they turn off all the lights. Weird. I took a youth group to do this one time. And sure enough, I woke up in the middle of the night. No light whatsoever. And you have no direction. I mean, you know, it's one thing for us to click the lights off in here. And there's that moment of, oh, I can't see anything. But after a while, you can kind of put your hand in front of your face. Underground, I, I mean, you can put your hand right here. And you cannot tell a differential between anything. And I woke up down in the middle of the ground and I couldn't see a thing. And I had to go to the bathroom. I did. I don't remember what I did. I, I hate to think what I did, but I, I just, all I know is I could not see anything. Light is extremely valuable. To know the direction that you're going, to be lost is such a helpless feeling. To know that God's word is like a light clicking on in the middle of the dark. It, it illuminates the way I'm supposed to walk and helps me avoid the pitfalls. And oh, I didn't realize that I was that close to the edge. And oh, I should, oh, I didn't know that was there. This tells us the way to walk. His word. A lamp into our feet, a light into our path. Next several sections, you know, from verse 21 to 128, you've got the value of the word. He talks about how it's more than gold. 
uh, verse 129 through 136, he talks about his longing for the word. Um, in verse 137 through 144, he talks about the righteousness of the word. He talks about in one ver uh, verse 147 how he rises before the dawning of the morning and cries for help. He says, my eyes are awake through the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Jump over with me, if you would, towards the end. And this is kind of where we're going to wrap up. Verse 160, the entirety of your word is truth. The whole thing. The, the, the Bible does not contain the truth. It is the truth. And it, it, it's such a subtle difference, but such a big difference to shift away from thinking that the, the truth is in here somewhere to this whole thing is truth. The entirety. There's, there's lots of people who will tell you that the truth is in here, but there's not a lot of people who necessarily think this whole thing is the truth, the authority. We, we live in a, in a day and age where we have so many resources available to us, and, and we can study, you know, and we can check our resources, and there's commentators, and there's, uh, you know, prophecy websites, and, and there's all this stuff, and, and we can study, and we can study, and we can study until we feel like we're an authority on the Word. Here's the problem with that. If I become an authority on the Word, the Word probably stops being my authority. And, and what so often we have a tendency to do is we say things like, well, I know I had this experience. And I know that this experience really happened. I know that this experience is genuine. And so here's what we do. We bring the Bible and we view it through the lens of our experience. We say, well, this is my experience. And so now I look through the lens of my experience to see where in here I can find that that matches with my experience instead of this. Here's my experience. Here's the Word of God. And I look at my experience through the Word, and if this doesn't say it's true, I'm actually willing to take my experience and say, that was a deception. I mean, let's face it, how many people in, on planet Earth today have seen the apparition of the Virgin Mary? Millions of people. So many that I personally don't, don't think it's possible that we could write it all off to some kind of mass hallucination. People are seeing something. Okay, But if I say, well, I had an apparition of the Virgin Mary, Right? And I take that and I begin to view the Word of God through my experience. Then this becomes an extra biblical experience. Instead of saying, well, you know what? Let me put this over here and let me look at my experience through the Word. I realize, oh, wow, the Queen of Heaven that Jeremiah talks about. Oh yeah, this one who's going to come and the one who now calls herself a co-mediatrix with Jesus. There's all kinds of experiences that we can have. The question is, are those experiences leading us to the place that we rely more upon the Word of God to process them, or are we going to a place where we say, you know what, I had these experiences and this doesn't touch them, but I know these are true. Really? Well, I mean, let's think about all the things that have blown through the church that this doesn't talk about at all, but we've said over here, so they, well, they, they're just extra biblical. I mean, I, I really don't want to get into a situation here where I'm just naming a bunch of stuff for you and potentially offending half of you and some of you thinking I'm never going back there again but there's been a lot of false doctrine that's come through the church see this is why we have to grab a hold of this and say the entirety of this this is the truth 
And Jesus said, if you abide in my word, and the word abide means to plant yourself in, if I plant myself in here, I'm going to know the truth. And it's the truth that's going to set me free. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Again, mentioned it a moment ago when we were talking about wisdom. But 2 Timothy chapter 3 all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration in the Greek, theonoustos, God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for doctrine, for correction, for re reproof, for instruction in righteousness, so that we are complete, thoroughly equipped for life, for every good work. Everything that God has for us, it's going to come from this, from the truth of this. I love this expression. I don't know where it came from. You know, there's this old trick when you're teaching the Bible that, you know, the, the first time that you use a quote, you say, as so-and-so says, and you, you quote the reference. Then the next time you say it, you say, as it's been said... And then the third time you say it, it's, as I've always said, you know. And I don't know where I first heard this, but I love this. It takes nothing less than a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. The church needs whole Christians. God wants whole Christians. Whole Christian marriages. Whole Christian parents. Whole Christian dads. Whole Christian moms whole Christian businessmen, whole Christian servants, whole Christian soldiers. The entirety of your word is truth. That the Lord would bring us to a place where we, we realize, wow, this, this whole thing right here, what a tremendous resource we have. Many of us, most of us on our laps tonight in digital form, downloadable from the internet. People gave their lives so that we could have this. What incredible riches we have. Like the psalmist says, more precious than gold, than fine gold, are your statutes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. You know, I just pray tonight. Um, yeah, Lord, it's, it's like driving a car, you know. We can never completely take our hand off the wheel your spirit just constantly sort of course correcting us, Lord. Thank you so much for your word tonight. Thank you for our church, Jesus. Thank you for what you're doing here. Father, I pray as we leave tonight, in these last few moments, as we just sort of meditate here upon your word, may this time of worship just be a time that your spirit just kind of works these things into the soft, this is the fleshly tablet of our heart. Lord, we love you. Thank you for tonight. Bless this church, Lord. Continue to grow this church. Make us healthy and strong. Make us whole Christians, Lord. Bless, I pray, the upcoming study that we'll do through the book of Revelation. I, I just pray now um, for, for our community that you'll use that. As a light, like we talked about tonight, so many people in the world today, afraid of the future. Your word, it's a lamp. It, it shows us what's going to happen and the way that we can go. I pray people would come and get saved as we study the book of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus. Lord, thank you. We bless your name.